Hello, everyone. I hope everyone is doing good and all is well. Today's chat is going to be about the Springfield, Illinois massacre, aka race riot, that took place between August the 14th through August the 16th of 1908. The heinous acts that took place during this horrible time changed the lives of over 2,000 African Americans forever. And it was the final straw which influenced the creation of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or the NAACP. It's so sad what happened in Springfield. And it took for so many lives to be taken before something was done about it. And with that being said, let's chat. Springfield, Illinois. When Illinois entered the Union, Springfield hadn't been quite broken in or settled yet. The first settler is said to have been Elisha Kelly, who was said to have come from North Carolina. Kelly was said to have settled Springfield in 1819. Now, what many may not know is former President Abraham Lincoln spent most of his adult life in Springfield, and he referred to the town as his home. In fact, his support is what contributed to the city becoming the state's capital. Around 1908, Springfield's population rose to about 47,000 citizens. And of those 47,000 citizens, around 2,500 of them were African Americans. Now, no one knows exactly when the first black people arrived in Springfield, but it has been said that the first black settler was a Haitian-born man by the name of William Florville. Now, Florville was said to have settled in Springfield in 1831. And Florville was a barber. And according to how the story goes, Abraham Lincoln was the one who encouraged him to set up a barber shop in Springfield. And Florville and Lincoln were said to be very close friends. They were so close Lincoln used some of Florville's jokes in his presidential speeches. Now, you all know, I must give you a little side note. Now, we all have probably already heard the rumors about Abraham Lincoln, right? Well, if you haven't heard, come a little closer and let me turn your light bulb on. President Lincoln is said to be biracial, half black. And his barber was black. A barber he went to for 24 years. Now, maybe it's just a coincidence, but it can make one's mind wonder if the rumors are true. But anyway, let's keep moving. But before we get back to the story... I must fill you all in on some interesting facts about Mr. William Florville and his friendship with Abraham Lincoln. Now, Florville and Lincoln, they met while Florville was on his way to Springfield. Florville was around 24 years old and Lincoln was 22 at the time. And the two men, they met when Florville saw Abe coming out of the forest with an axe. The men spoke. And they ended up traveling to Springfield together. Now, with Abe's encouragement, Florville opened a barber shop. And he became Lincoln's barber. And Florville later opened the first laundry in Springfield. And he became one of the town's leading colored men. Florville also picked up the name Billy the Barber. And when Billy cut Abe's hair, Abe would tell Billy... Billy, I want you to shave me and trim my hair also. And I want you to do it as if I was going to be married. And Abe would give him a dollar. And well, Billy, he gave Abe a dollar back. 
on his actual wedding day. Now, Florville, or Billy the Barber, he wasn't an average businessman. He was, a, he was very unique, and the way he promoted his businesses proved that. Not only was Florville a very skilled barber, he was also a very talented musician. He wrote poetry, and he was a master at telling jokes. And Florville used his many talents to promote his businesses. Now, as time passed, Florville became a more prominent businessman and entrepreneur. And he and Abe's friendship grew more and more. In Florville, he opened a catering business and he was one of the founders of St. John the Baptist Church in Springfield. And for Florville and Lincoln, they grew so close as time passed. When Lincoln moved to Washington, D.C., he relied on Florville to look after his estate and his son's beloved dog, Fido. And Florville and Lincoln, like I said, they were very close. They were so close. I mean close. When Lincoln passed away, Florville, a black man, was invited to sit in the front row close to the coffin as an honorary among the dignitaries of the funeral march. However, Florville chose to be in the back with the rest of the African Americans, and he performed as a clarinetist in the funerals band. Now, I had to fill you all in on those interesting facts, but let's get back to the story. Now, Florville, like I said, he was a very prominent businessman within Springfield, but others, they weren't so lucky. Now, Springfield's economy, it was built upon coal mining, transportation systems, manufacturing, and local businesses such as hotels, restaurants, and taverns. Now, with so many opportunities, one would think that there would be enough good jobs to go around, right? I mean, there actually were, but not if you were a black person within the town. Racism and white supremacy was at an all-time high during this time. So the black people, they didn't get the good jobs within the industries such as manufacturing or transportation. Now, not only were the black people prevented from getting the good jobs, the white people complained about the fact that the black people had jobs altogether. I mean, you have to remember that slavery was still going on throughout the South. And the white people, they also complained that the black people drove down the pay by taking lower wages. And only four black people out of nearly a thousand had skilled jobs. Now, the railroad, they would only allow blacks to work as porters men who swept the train stations and carried the baggage. And skilled positions such as you know, brake men or engineer. They went to whites only. And not only did blacks within the town have to take low paying, high labor jobs. As with any other town at this time, black people were barred from many restaurants, parks, hotels and other public facilities. And black neighborhoods, they were scattered throughout Springfield. There wasn't like one predominantly black neighborhood or anything like that. And about 90% of the black people, they lived in the eastern heavily working class area of the capital. And many of the poorest black residents, they lived in what was referred to as bad lands. The bad lands were northeast of downtown and included the worst rundown housing in the city. The bad lands earned its nickname because this area included poverty, bad housing, and the authorities allowed cheap saloons, houses of prostitution, and gambling dens within the area to keep this type of activity from making it into the white neighborhoods. Now, the very allegations that were said to cause the Springfield Massacre, I mean, they occurred in the Badlands on a regular basis, but a blind eye was turned upon it. Now, the difference this time was that the act 
was said to have happened to a white woman in an all-white working-class suburban neighborhood. Now that we have our backstory, let's get into what we're all here for. The Springfield Massacre. Citizens of Springfield started the morning of August the 14th like any other morning. They grabbed their cup of coffee and the morning paper, not knowing that what they read in today's paper would change their lives forever. On August the 14th, 1908, the paper printed that a black man attempted to assault a white woman in her home the night before. Shortly after the paper reported this story, a second report was made stating another white woman was assaulted by a black man, according to some reports. However, other reports state that there was only one assault and the second report was about a recent homicide. Now, Springfield police took two men into custody for the alleged crimes. George Richardson was arrested for the alleged attempted sexual assault of Mabel Hollum. And Joe James, he was arrested for the allegedly taking the life of a white railroad engineer named Clergy Ballard. Now, angry white mobs began to form after the first report was made. And after the second report was made, the angry white mobs decided to take matters into their own hands. Now, a mob of around 5,000 white people gather outside the Springfield jail demanding the two prisoners so they could lynch them. The lawmen refused to turn the prisoners over to the mob. The county sheriff and a white business owner named Harry Loper, they secretly removed the two prisoners throughout through the back door and they sent them by train to another jail located in Bloomington, Illinois. And the large angry white mob, they became infuriated with rage when they discovered the two men were gone and they couldn't have them. So they turned their rage on the black citizens of Springfield. The mob spread out and headed for the black neighborhoods. And according to some reports, the mob shouted, Lincoln freed you. Now we'll show you where you belong. When the mob came up on the home of Scott Burton, Burton used his shotgun to try and protect his home and his life. Burton was the first victim to be lynched by the mob. The second victim to be lynched by the mob was 84-year-old William Donegan. The mob targeted Mr. Donegan because they were already angry at the fact Donegan, a black man, had been married to a white woman for over 30 years. The angry mob tore through the town with uncontrollable rage and violence. They lynched any African American they could find, and they destroyed homes owned by black people and black businesses who served black people. Of course, the restaurant owned by Harry Loper the white man who helped the sheriff sneak the two black suspects out of town was the first to be destroyed by the angry white mob. The mob's rampage lasted for days. They even extended their violence outside the city limits into small communities. However, the mob made sure not to destroy any homes of white people or whites only businesses. And all of the lynchings and horrible violence took place just blocks away from Abraham Lincoln's historical home. After almost three days of brutal violence, military troops were sent in to restore order within the town. When it was all said and done, nearly 2,000 black residents had fled the town to never return again. And some reports state that the 16 people lost their lives, included an infant. Now, other reports state 
that there was more than 16 people who lost their lives during this massacre. And in fact, there were hundreds of lives lost on this day and throughout this time. Now, we probably would never know the actual number of lives lost because there was poor record keeping and a plain old fashioned cover up as with all the others. And of course, the massacre was initially called a race riot, only for it to be later revealed that a massacre did in fact occur. And according to the reports, Joe James, remember he was the black man accused of killing the white railroad engineer, Clergy Ballard. James was found guilty and his life was ended by hanging. As for George Richardson, he was the black man accused of attempting to sexually assault the white woman named Mabel Hollum. Well, Mabel Hollum confessed to lying on George Richardson. And it was revealed that she invented the sexual assault story to hide the affair she was having with a white man from her husband. And Mabel, Mabel and her family, oh, they quickly moved away from Springfield once all of this was discovered. Around 150 members of the white mob were arrested for the part they played in the massacre, but none were ever really convicted. Only one out of the 150 actually spent time in jail. He was sentenced to 30 days. The Springfield Massacre shook the nation and gained national attention. And it gained national attention because this was the first massacre to take place in the North in over half a century. Now, six months after the massacre on February the 12th, 1909, on the centennial anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's birthday, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, better known as the NAACP, was formed. Well, that brings us to the end of today's chat. But tell me what you think. What do you think about Abe and his friends, Billy the Barber? What about the allegations of Abe being half black? What about Joe James? Do you think he really took the life of the railroad engineer? Or do you think he was falsely accused like the other black man, George Richardson? What do you think about George Richardson being falsely accused by Miss Mabel Hollum and her lie helping to contribute to so much destruction? Tell me your thoughts in the comments below. Please like the video. Please share the video. Please subscribe if you haven't already. And until next time, peace, love, and blessings.